Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, my name is Natasha Kisten, and I am the Lexus, uh, Nexus GRC uh, consultant, um, specifically with regards to our Lexus Nexus GRC product. And I will be your facilitator at today's session. Um, we will be talking um, about um, fraud and ethics um, strategies in the public sector um, at today's um, session. Our session in particular will be focusing around challenges in the public sector and how the public sector can overcome these challenges and gain confidence again. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, you can send your questions for our speaker using the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, you, we will be having a session at um, the end of um, the presentation that will be done um, in order to, to attend those questions. I see that our chat box is uh, lighting up already with regards to comments people are making. Um, that's exactly what it is there for. If you would like to make comments that is not really specific um, to questions that you want answered by our facilitator. Um, the webinar will be made available to all delegates a few minutes after the um, a few days, excuse me, a few days after the session. Um, the slides themselves, though, um, will not be made available. You can reference those slides um, at the recording um, that will be made available to you. Um, on the next item and at uh, today's session, I will be welcoming Jamie Mudley, who is the founder and CEO of Green Governance and Consultancy Firm that was established to promote good governance and restore an ethical society. She is an admitted attorney and established GRC uh, professional specializing in corporate governance, risk management, legal compliance, fraud management, ethics and conduct risk management within the private and public sectors. Jamie has extensive experience in IT, data governance, telecommunications, public administration, mining and petroleum, as well as health and safety and the financial sector. So we're in for quite a treat today um, with Jamie taking us through her presentation. Um, thank you and over to you, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Natasha, thank you so much. Are you able to, to hear me clearly? Yes, we are able to hear you, Jamie. Okay, that's great. I just want to share my screen quickly. Great. Thank you so much to LexisNexis for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Jamie Mudley, and uh, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts with you today. Um, around ethics and fraud risk strategies in the public sector, uh, a subject that is close to my heart. Um, I've been within the public sector for many years, um, worked within municipalities and state-owned entities as well, um, and have you know, a very close understanding um, to uh, or in this subject of ethics and, and, and anti-fraud um, uh, programs uh, within the public sector. So my presentation today is really going to talk to you about, um, you know, the governance challenges we are facing as a country uh, holistically, um, you know, going into uh, a 20-year democracy and how far we've come. Um, what are the levels of public confidence or what is the public perceptions that we are seeing um, within uh, the sector, within um, uh, the public administration at the moment? Um, what is our status quo and where do we see ourselves? And then I'd like to then give you a few examples and recommendations of how we can improve accountability and integrity um, within the high-risk areas and how do we mitigate them using key strategies um, to overcome um, these hurdles that we find ourselves in within the public sector. We find that um, in, you know, within the public administration, we are confronted with many obstacles, um, and this is this you know many challenges, many obstacles, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, uh, lack of efficiency. Um, the public procurement system itself is a breeding ground for corruption 
and uh, maladministration malfeasance, um, a number of audit reports coming through uh, the Zondo Commission, um, evidence you know, th that's relaying um, massive corruption, fraud, um, and unethical behavior. And ultimately, we find ourselves in, a, in an unethical society, a culture that is running deep through uh, the, a thread that's running right from the top through every sphere of gov government, every department that uh, we see us, uh, within our country. Um, our constitution, however, calls for the highest professional um, ethics. Um, and, and, and that is an irony that, that we find. We have a, um, you know, laws and, and policies, uh, a, a great constitution drafted, a great policies that we, we find ourselves having drafted, but the ability to implement them and action them, um, this is where we are failing. So some of my quotes here today um, says, to oppose corruption in government is the highest obligation of patriotism. And corruption creates and uh, increases poverty and exclusion. This is what we see in our society, society today. Um, the poor and the marginalized, the gap between the, the rich and the poor um, continues to increase and widen to such an extent that, uh, you know, even our, our national development plan, where it seeks to, to provide a zero tolerance for corruption, um, I think we are really going in the opposite direction. Um, and we really have a lot of work to do to changing mindsets um, and changing the, the, the trajectory that we find ourselves um, in at the moment. Some of the reports that I've looked at um, within the um, Corruption Watch, um, there was an analysis of corruption trends report in 2021 in September that was released by Corruption Watch and reveals the extent to which corruption has continued unabated during the first half of this year. There were at least um, 1,964 whistleblowing uh, reports that were, were received within both public and private sectors. And we find maladministration, uh, procurement corruption, abuse of authority, um, and uh, corruption within our uh, police departments, uh, our law enforcement departments. And this has really just um, you know, degraded the, the, the confidence that we have as a society, as a community, um, as civil society in our government, um, and in our, uh, in our state. These are some of the figures that came through in that report where almost two thirds or 64% of South Africans say that corruption has increased um, uh, and state institutions are seen as corrupt, state owned ent entities are seen as corrupt. Uh, now, who do we trust in? Because this is what accountability brings trust within government. And at this point in time, um, we find a, a complete lack in accountability at the moment uh, within our public sector. 70% um, of South Africans say government is performing badly and uh, against the fight uh, against corruption. We find you know, the president as well as many other ministers uh, speaking about this topic and creating many um, organizations and uh, committees, et cetera, to fight uh, th this battle, but um, we are failing dismally in, 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 in having some effectiveness um, and, and, and getting, gaining some ground in, 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 in fighting corruption in our country. Um, but what do we do? Uh, how do we restore trust in our government? What are the key um, strategies that we use? Uh, we have, you know, we have the constitution, we have laws, regulations, uh, anti-corruption frameworks, um, King 4, um, and many other anti-corruption pieces of legislation. Um, and as I said before, policies and laws may be well drafted, but the implementation thereof is where we are failing. The status quo in, in our country, um, we find many audit reports coming through uh, talking about and, and revealing um, unethical leadership. Um, you know, 
only 18 out of our country's 257 municipalities um, have unqualified audits without findings. And that is, you know, just one piece of, of a statistic that is really um, disappointing and really shocking um, as a country. 65% um, of councils or municipalities have uh, data that is so flawed, not even credible enough to use uh, within their municipalities. Um, sorry about that. 74% of councils fail to adequately follow up allegations of financial and procurement misconduct and fraud. And personally, I find this is an area um, of uh, the area of consequence management where we are failing as a country. We have disregarded reports from the audit, Auditor General. We disregard forensic reports uh, or any other investigations and recommendations that come through. We are ignoring these reports and we are not implementing the recommendations. Um, this undesirable state of deteriorating audit outcomes shows the various local government role players have been slow in implementation and in many instances have disregarded the, the, the recommendations. Now, where do we want to be and where do we see ourselves? Um, firstly, we want ethical leaders. Um, at the top, flowing from the top, they, they say the fish rots from the head. Um, we need ethical leadership from the top. We need to root out um, the bad apples, so to say, and uh, choose ethical leadership into power at every level, at every sphere of government. We need integrity, accountability, transparency, and trust. And these are the pillars um, that we find, you know, ingrained within our constitution and many other laws. Uh, but we need to, to get to a point where we have ethical leadership. Inter, um, intellectual virtues or values, um, we need skilled resources, work ethic and partnerships, uh, partnerships with civil society, with community, with business, with private sector. Um, and, and we need to look to skilled resources. Uh, we need merit-based and performance-based um, people and, uh, and work ethic within our departments and within our organizations. Then we need to use the strategy that we build. How do we build our ethics strategies, our compliance and risk strategies, um, and align these to our budgets? Um, we need to be able to uh, assess uh, our resources and performance management systems so that they align and they are able to be implemented accordingly. And then ultimately, we want to trans. We, we want a transformation of, of the culture. We want to build an ethical society. We want an ethical culture within South Africa, and uh, not just within public sector, but throughout. I think private sector as well. When I mentioned partnerships, I mentioned um, we need uh, this kind of stakeholder engagement where there is agreement and unity uh, and a uniform approach. To, um, to ethics and cult culture transformation in our, um, in our country. So I just wanna to touch on the high risks uh, that we find um, coming from all of the, um, the audit reports that I've mentioned to you and um, the reports that have come from the IRMSA, um, IRMSA reports, uh, IRMSA risk report, as well as uh, business tech, some of the, the data that I've got on the slide show that some of the top risks we are facing as a country, aside from high unemployment rates, the growing dis income disparities, inequality, um, et cetera, failure of governance uh, within the public sector, unmanageable fraud and corruption, um, the scarcity of unified ethical and visionary leadership is, is what I just mentioned just now. Um, and continuing, continuing private and public governance failures, um, failure to root out and curb entrenched corruption. These are trends that have been coming through uh, these reports um, year on year on year, and they continue uh, to rear its ugly head um, across the board within the public sector as well as the private sector. 
And um, these are some of the areas that we really need to zoom into, um, assess the risk, understand um, where the root causes are and uh, find mitigation strategies to manage these risks um, within, within our uh, government departments. So how do we manage these risks? And the focus of, of my presentation is really, how do we manage these risks? What are the strategies? Um, how do we govern ethics? Um, this, this slide here on my uh, left-hand side is a framework that's been put out by the Ethics Institute um, talking about the governance and, of ethics, um, listing key areas like leadership commitment, which is a number one area we need ethical leadership from the top. Um, governance structures need to be analyzed, assessed, reorganized. Uh, we need performance management systems in place, key structures like your, your committees, um, risk committees, audit committees, et cetera, all in place. And then the focus on ethics or integrity management. This is where um, we are falling short in applying um, the, the key um, indicators like having ethics risk assessments done or fraud risk assessments done, a full um, comprehensive ethics strategy in place, uh, codes and policies. I think we, we do have those codes and policies, well-written codes of ethics as well. We have that in place. Um, and then we need to institutionalize these codes and policies and codes of ethics and codes of conduct, et cetera. And when I say institutionalize, I mean, we need consistent training across the board and we need to be able to show that um, these are being enforced and implemented across every level of government, not just to, um, to some employees um, of, of certain departments, but a uniform and a unified approach um, to implementation. And then a system to monitor and report um, on ethics uh, risks. How are we doing in implementation? How are we performing? Is it effective enough to manage the risk? Is the risk being um, minimized or eliminated at some point? And these are some of the assessments that continue, uh, we, we need to continue to do um, within our organizations to improve um, GRC, to improve ethical conduct, um, and to take uh, action where there are um, where there is unethical conduct, where there is fraud, where there is misconduct, uh, and we need to apply the, the rules um, to, to these uh, programs. On the right, I've got uh, fraud risks and ethics risks. Um, these are some of the risks that, you know, from my previous assessments that we've, we've undertaken within government, um, I've mentioned the fraud risks, right? Like within procurement, tender fraud, collusion, um, overtime, um, within licensing, cybersecurity. Um, these are key areas that really do need, um, the, the red flags have already been raised. And these are areas where we need to, uh, to zoom into. Um, private work within the public sector, there are regulations that, that govern um, these areas, but they're not being complied with. There is a high level of non-compliance within public sector, and there really is no consequence management where there are findings uh, of misconduct. Gifts and entertainment as well, very gray areas uh, here. And we need, instead of just a, a code of ethics, we need a code of conduct that really does um, uh, you know, identify areas where disciplinary or strong disciplinary action will be taken and what is our approach to a zero tolerance for corruption and fraud. Um, political interference and cadre deployments, um, again, nepotism, favoritism, these are key areas, key ethics risks that we find within government that we need, uh, we need codes and we need policies to deal um, significantly with these areas of, of uh, unethical behavior and, uh, and misconduct. So, 
So what is the road to change? And the pillars of accountability um, I've, I've highlighted here, um, said we approach this. Um, we, these are the pillars that I have identified to, uh, to address fraud and corruption risks. Accountability is number one. I think it's it's right at the top. Uh, enforcing accountability ensures that we have um, ethical people, um, ethical leadership, the lack of heart of our poor uh, Africa. So we need accountability for government spending. We need to improve, um, uh, you know, oversight. I think uh, here I've highlighted that Parliament needs to have increased oversight and scrutiny over the min over ministries, over over ministers, over public services. Um, parliamentary committees must ensure that there are follow ups. At this point in time, and through my research, we find a number of recommendations through the Auditor General and Chapter Nine institutions um, are being ignored. And uh, really, just there's a disinterest in implementing, and there are no consequences for non implementation. So we need an increase in oversight from public public servants. Enforcing compliance with laws and regulations, reporting requirements and, and procedures. Um, this created to ensure the use of the public money uh, is done um, prudently and responsibly, responsibly in the public interest. Um, these, create, these procedures and processes must be in place. We need procedures to identify non-compliances as well, breach in laws so that we can report in real time through our uh, either our GRC tools or systems um, to report to the governance committees um, and for decisive action to be taken um, against the, the wrongdoers here. Consequence management, I think this uh, topic will flow throughout my presentation. Um, and um, again, highlighted in, is one of the pillars uh, to accountability is to root out, uh, take decisive action, um, have proper disciplinary procedures in place, um, and not just disciplinary procedures, but the ability to, um, to criminalize certain actions and take action through um, our, our police, um, the, the, the SAPS um, uh, and, and other law enforcement agencies within our country. Effective internal controls, we need regular audits, we need regular uh, risk assessments, we need regular ethics assessments, um, and we need to understand the maturity of our GRC systems to understand where are the red flags within our context or our environment in order to address them effectively. Key mitigation strategies, I've highlighted a four pillar approach to integrity management. Um, this comes from the public sector integrity management framework um, in prevention, uh, detection, investigation, and resolution. These are, these are four key pillars. Um, and, and this is going into a more a, a deeper level of implementation. Um, and I just want to highlight that if we don't have these systems for prevention, detection, investigation, and resolution, um, I think this slide really does, uh, will we'll be able to highlight where uh, we are lacking as an organization, or as a department of government or uh, whatever institution you are from, it does highlight where you will be lacking um, if we do not have these measures in place or these programs in place. Um, in order to prevent, we need proper GRC systems. We need tools, systems uh, to identify red flags. We need to understand what is our culture. In order to do that, we need to, uh, to have ethics surveys at least annually um, to know what are the pain points, where are, are the challenges, um, and to have anonymity when you have these surveys put out um, within your organizations. This is, this is key. Uh, policies um, are, are key. Risk and compliance management tools or assessments that need to be done at least annually or quarterly to give reports back to the risk committees and audit committees. 
Conflict of interest is a key area. Um, Pre-employment screening. Um, these are all areas or these are all measures and programs we can put in place uh, to help prevent um, uh, misconduct. Um, development of, of your ethics, uh, code of ethics and code of conduct. These you know, are really just the building blocks that we need to have in place. Then in order to detect, um, monitoring is key. Um, having the right people in place, so your teams, um, compliance officers or risk officers, ethics officers, uh, your fraud um, and forensics department, these are key uh, people um, that you, or departments and teams that you, you will need to have in place to monitor and manage uh, the systems and, and processes that I've mentioned above. Um, Non-compliance reporting, analysis of information, um, your internal audit, Whistleblowing and reporting mechanisms is also another key mechanism in order to detect. Um, but in order to promote this, we need to have um, a good and a strong whistleblowing policy in place that is, you know, it, it must be reviewed annually. Um, your system needs to be reviewed annually. Is it working effectively? Um, is the whistleblower protected? Is the Protected Disclosures Act uh, being uh, promoted and are people being trained on, on these areas. Investigation is then your, your next area. Um, investigations, policies, um, taking a multi-disciplinary uh, or agency approach um, is key, having the right stakeholders uh, to, to engage with, law enforcement agencies I've mentioned, um, to ensure that you have proper investigative procedures in place. And then once you have those recommendations from the reports, either from your internal audit, from your forensics teams, um, or coming from um, external audits as well, um, these need to be, they must be resolution. They must be uh, a full circle here. Disciplinary action, decisive um, loss recovery, um, trying to, to, to recover a wasteful and, and uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, for example, um, to hold people to account, um, we must ensure proper consequence management, criminal prosecution, and uh, communication of successes. So um, not just a punitive approach, but to ensure that we communicate successes uh, within the organization as well. And something that I found that we don't do often enough is to blacklist suppliers and, and certain um, companies we found to have been uh, wanting or um, you know, uh, behaving unethically or found um, uh, to have committed some sort of fraud or, or corruption. We need to, to uh, blacklist these with the National Treasury um, and take it to the next level um, to ensure that these uh, criminals um, are being convicted and um, action is being taken. Jenny? Yes. Sorry, could we just ask you to close your Outlook in the background, please? Your emails. Okay, let me just get to that. Proceed. Yes, you may. Okay, so um, let me go back. Is a key area content and rationale of the code and of ethics, application of ethical management principles, and proper use of official uh, power. These are you know key areas where we need to ensure. Uh, we have a full training and development program that is across um, across the organization. Um, setting up an ethics office, um, something that we don't really see very often. Ethics of the people behind or the skills that we need to actual ethics assessments, to do the maturity assessments and the audits that need to be done. And the training as well. I think the, these are um, this is a key 
uh, tool um, we need to have within our organizations to strengthen um, uh, you know, the, the, some of the areas that I've mentioned earlier. Whistleblower protection, again, um, we need a full, a, a strong mechanism for um, or hotline um, in order to ensure that uh, people are able to report without fear, uh, without intimidation. Um, we need to keep um, reports anonymous. Um, and in order to comply with laws and reporting requirements, uh, we need a scrutiny in this area. We need to ensure um, that we have the correct data to analyze. Are we protecting the whistleblower? Are we encouraging reporting uh, of non-compliance and unethical behavior within our organization? And how effective is that through the current systems that, uh, that we have in place? Human resource management and strategies. Um, here again, um, performance management techniques uh, and systems need to be put in place. Uh, we need to ensure that they are effective as well. Um, we need a system to ensure that we monitor how people are performing. What is the work ethic? Um, are we able to uh, assess performance against, uh, against those uh, performance management agreements that we've put in place? And um, can we assess, uh, you know, are we entrenching an ethical set of values uh, through these performance management systems that we, that we have in place? This is key as well um, in, in how we hire uh, the right people for the right jobs, um, using merit, using, uh, you know, people that have the right skills, the right experience and the right education. Um, to, to, to be able to appoint them to the right positions and to allow them to be effective in their jobs. Institutionalizing ethically competent decision-making. How are we promoting an ethical culture through decision-making? Are we assessing all the decisions made by our leaders? Um, are we holding them to account? Um, some reports have mentioned uh, creating laws to ensure that uh, people take accountability for the uh, decisions that are made. Ministers take accountability for decisions that are made, that we justify them, uh, the decisions that are made, um, you know, justify them effectively enough to show that they warrant those uh, decisions that are, that are being made. So lastly, just, how, you know, strengthening the culture within our organizations, within our sphere of influence, um, and you know, within our country as a whole. Um, capacitation, um, I mentioned training and recruitment um, and cohesion in efforts to combat corruption, fraud um, and unethical behavior is key. Central ethics and anti-corruption framework. We have these frameworks in place. Government already has the, the, the NDP. We have um, anti-corruption uh, frameworks in place but are we implementing them well enough? Do we have those deeper levels of systems and processes in place? Um, effective oversight and monitoring. Um, of the framework. Um, and our report successes is also key. I think people do need to be rewarded for, uh, for, for great performance um, and if they are achieving what they have set out to achieve. Um, horizontal and seamless cooperation in investigations. I think we do need a cross-functional approach here uh, across all departments, across leaders and uh, agencies as well. Uh, and to partner with civil society and communities to ensure that we have one approach um, to investigations um, and consequence management as well. GRC tools and professionalization of the, the functions um, is, is really key. I think we need to assess what kind of tools are we using? Are they effective? Um, are we able to um, get the correct, uh, the, the, the effective data out of the systems that we are using, are we able to address 
um, firstly understand red flags? Are we able to address them? Um, are we able to, to take decisive action uh, where needed and put in those mitigation plans? Um, tracking of recommendations of reports, um, going back you know, to, to reports that have already been made. And um, there are a number of them where you will find um, recommendations not being implemented. Um, having a, a tracking tool to be able to track whether these are being implemented, are they being implemented effectively and um, is action being ta taken. Accessibility of information, uh, we need more accessibility of information to deter unethical behavior. Um, analyzing the data from our whistleblowing systems and mechanisms, um, analyzing the data from our forensics and frauds uh, uh, departments, our ethics and risk departments, um, having a full data analysis of, of this information will really help um, to target these areas. And removing barriers that inhibit responsible whistleblowing. Um, here, I think um, there is consensus that we need to do more, we need to do better uh, with you know, the, the um, Deokaran uh, case, as well as uh, recently the, the Moti brothers and all of the, these cases that, that are coming up within um, our country, um, we really do need to do more to remove barriers. Uh, for whistleblowing and for protected whistleblowing, for um, actually viewing our whistleblowers as assets to our companies or organizations and our country as a whole. And strict enforcement of consequence management um, is key. Just to round this off, um, I really believe that um, it all starts with you and I and um, the people that we choose to, to put in, in power. The only route to changing our trajectory is to ensure that we change our mindsets first and um, consist consistently make ethical decisions um, and choose people of integrity into positions of power. We hold the key to the success of our country and the livelihoods of the generations to come. Um, we also have the power to change and influence those um, that we find around us, the circles and spheres of influence that we find ourselves in, we have the, the power to change and influence those people around us. So let's um, you know, take from this, if anything, um, that we um, try to make a positive impact. Um, compliance is really the minimum standard, but we take it to the next level to, uh, to become ethical, um, to, to hold the values of our constitution of integrity and transparency, accountability and fairness, take all of these values um, and make them our own, uh, applying them to everyday decision making, applying them to decision making within our jobs, within our work environments, and um, within people that we are raising up as leaders as well, in order to make uh, a positive change um, in, our, in our organization. And just to highlight the tools um, being used by LexisNexis, uh, GRC systems and tools um, are able to assist in identifying red flags, understanding um, what are your compliance requirements, what are the laws that we need to comply with, um, understanding what are the risks um, in our context and how do we manage those effectively to promote and to um, to perform compliance audits as well, um, to put in those key mitigation strategies and monitor the, them effectively. Um, at Green Governance, we are also able to um, analyze and assess the data and perform um, training according to your needs. And this is what we are trying to do across the organizations that we are helping at the moment um, to understand, um, to analyze, to report and to monitor uh, within this key area and um, eventually and essentially to get to a point where we uh, effect change and um, we improve the ethical culture of the society that we find ourselves in. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for listening to this presentation. Over to you, Natasha. so much uh, Jamie for your insights and for taking 
Pharma today, um, you know, to, to give us this information. I particularly enjoyed the slide with regards to, um, you know, the governance and risk framework. Um, you know, in particular, the item in relation to ethics and the activities that we need to concentrate on around those ethics. It was a very nice map, definitely something that I'm going to be pinning up um, on my GRC system. Um, definitely a nice one there. We have some questions, but before we go on to it, we have a poll that we are going to be running and we would appreciate it if all of our delegates can please just answer the poll. Um, we will be sharing that information with you as well. Um, a question that has come up, two questions that have come up from the panel, I think one may have been answered already, was um, who is supposed to implement uh, this? Question mark politicians. And I think you summed that up in the end, you know, with respect to saying that it's really everybody's responsibility, whether you're in the private or the public sector, who is responsible um, for implementing um, these actions. Another question that came out, and I'm going to hand this one over through to you, was that um, you mentioned blacklisting, Jamie. Um, but are there relevant structures in place with respect to the public sector? We definitely know that we have one for the banking sector, but what about the public sector? What is out there? Thanks, Natasha. Um, yes, so in terms of blacklisting, I've mentioned um, there, is, there is a system in place already, um, and it's with the National Treasury. Um, they have a blacklisting, uh, they have a list already, and they do have a system to report um, either suppliers, vendors, contractors, um, or individuals as well um, that have been found guilty uh, either within a court of law or um, through other mechanisms. Um, and um, those individuals or those companies are being blacklisted at the moment. Um, what I can say is that it's not widely known. And um, it's, uh, it, if you look at the, the National Treasury website, um, you will find a link there where you can get the right department or the right uh, people um, where you can actually report um, these companies or individuals to have them blacklisted and to provide uh, the, you know, the documentation or um, I'm not sure what the criteria is in terms of what you need to uh, submit or uh, you know, present to them. Um, but as long as there has been a decisive um, outcome of an investigation um, and the person is pronounced or found guilty of, mis uh, of fraud or corruption, then there is a, a specific uh, process and, and a blacklist um, that they can be placed on. That's, that's very informative. Thank you very much for that. Um, I wonder if the results of the poll um, are in already and if that is something that we can share. Oh, there we go. So the question was, do you believe that anonymity can be maintained through the whistleblowing process? And that's quite a good result. So 57% of us are saying yes, and 43% are saying no. So definitely some work to be done there, even if we look at the numbers from our small poll that we are having here. The second one is, are you interested in a, in a free public sector risk consultation with LexisNexis? Also 55% of you saying yes, and 45% of you saying no. It's definitely a change, you know, from a digital um, world that we are living in. Um, it's good to see at the end of the day that we are looking for those platforms to assist us instead of the, the usual old um, Excel spreadsheet. So very good response there as well. Um, and are you interested in the integrated GRC and assurance solution provided by Green Governance as well? And, um, and that's some information that will come through from there also. So thank you very much for that. Um, that brings us to the end of today's proceedings. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we trust that you have found the session informative. Certainly it has been for me. And thank you again, Jamie. It's been so brilliant to have you on board. Um, cheers, everyone. Thank you.